Good evening and welcome to The Drum. I'm Julia Baird. Coming up tonight... Classroom consequences. Strong responses to a television ad in the same-sex marriage debate. As the government scrambles to get power prices down, we ask, what are energy disruptors up to? And breaking the stained glass ceiling, the Anglicans appoint the first female archbishop in Australia. And joining me on the panel this evening, Ali Kadri from the Islamic Council of Queensland. Hello. Chief Executive of Diverse City Careers Jobs, Gemma Lloyd. Hi. And host of Christian radio show Open House, Stephen Doherty, makes a return. Hello, Welcome. Julia. Hi. And if you're on Twitter, you can join us there. Just use the hashtag The Drum, and we are also on Facebook. Now, a TV ad promoting the no vote in the same-sex marriage postal survey has prompted strong responses. The ad was made by the Coalition for Marriage Group and argues that the plebiscite will have consequences in the classroom. School told my son he could wear a dress next year if he felt like it. When same-sex marriage passes as law overseas, this type of program become widespread and compulsory. Kids in Year 7 are being asked to role-play being in a same-sex relationship. You can say no. Coalition Senator Zed Seselja, who supports the no vote, says the ad raises legitimate concerns and that any opposing arguments are just shouted down. Even those who argue strongly in favour of same-sex marriage, I think, have all acknowledged uh, that there are other changes, there are other potential changes, and these mothers are clearly putting the case that, uh, you know, their ability to object uh, to fairly radical sex education uh, in schools and the like uh, will be much harder uh, if you redefine marriage in the Marriage Act. But the Education Minister rejected the suggestion that the vote would mean any change in the national curriculum. It is patently ridiculous to suggest that allowing same-sex couples to marry is somehow going to see some new wave of teaching reform sweep across the country. That's just not going to happen. Um, you know, this is a simple issue uh, and it should not be conflated with other issues. Stephen, was this ad fair? Julia, I don't... It's a funny place, isn't it, in Australia? We have political advertising around a, a matter of public importance and the only response that can be made from the other side is, well, why don't you just shut up because you're wrong? I mean, it's supposed to be a debate. So if we're going to have a debate, that but, means but, both but... sides need to be able to put their view. And sorry, just I don't yes. mean to, to yes. be rude, but um, research shows that people who are uh, concerned about same-sex marriage are concerned about safe, the Safe Schools program, that they see those two things as linked. And Ros Ward herself linked them back in 2013 when she said marriage was state-sponsored homophobia, which got in the way of the Safe Schools program. So... I'm sorry, there's your link. Mm. But she's not involved with this particular campaign and there is only one question that people being, are being asked to answer and it's got nothing to do with education programs, it's just about marriage between no, but two that adults. doesn't mean that changes to the law in one area don't have consequences in another area. Every bill that goes to the parliament, mm. um, there's a select committee that sits on that bill that looks at all of the consequences. So it's just wrong to say that it's a simple question. Mm. It's one of the most profound questions that defines our society and that question is, what is the most appropriate appropriate unit to give for the care that for the creation care and protection of children mm. and the most appropriate classically the most appropriate uh, union has been between a man and a woman um, because that's that's the way in which the human race works mm. and so you think these concerns about the education of children are legitimate to bring up in that framework? I know that they are the concerns of people who are voting no and who are one wondering about the consequences of this question mm. there are others the religious freedom question is the biggest question of all for me and it will change the climate within our cities we've seen examples from overseas but here's a great example um, Trinity Christian University Trinity Wesleyan University in Canada that's a school that has a statement of faith, including say, a traditional marriage, for both teachers and staff. So you say, OK, fair enough, it's a private Christian religious institution. So what's the problem? The problem is the Law Society of Canada has said, well, we won't recognise any of the lawyers that you produce because you have a statement of faith that's in favour of traditional marriage. 
Now, that's got to be an attack on the freedom of those people to learn at an institution with a certain doctrinal framework. Mm. These are people of faith, with a third-party organisation punishing them and restricting them from the legal profession. Now, that's in the Supreme Court. It'll be interesting to see how it goes. Mm. And we are going to return to the question of religious freedom mm. and the drum in the next couple of weeks. But, Gemma, what do you, what's your response to the ad? Well... You know, it's funny because, Stephen, you talk, mentioned, you know, consequences a few times and I think that the consequences that aren't being raised as a result of these ads are the consequences of the mental health of young people who associate themselves with being in the LGBTI community. So by putting such advertisements out with mothers, you know, saying how against they are, the children are going to see that. And we already saw after the plebiscite was actually introduced a 40% increase to calls to Beyond Blue and a 20% increase in calls to Qline from the LGBTI community. So, I mean, this plebiscite is having not just effects from, you know, a pot potential financial perspective, but also from a general health and wellbeing perspective. And, you know, at the end of the day, the whole thing around safe schools is wellness. And it's valuing diversity as well. So yeah. I don't think... Well, we have a debate that this group didn't start. And by the way, I wasn't involved in the making of that ad. I have nothing to do with that group. I just happen to agree with some of their arguments. Mm. So we didn't. that group didn't start the debate, neither did the Christian community. It was started, no, but they're certainly it was exacebating by the LGBT. it in the wrong well, way. Well, they're not exacerbating it. They're doing what they've been but asked to do, <laughs> express a view, take part in the debate. And I hope... And the position that I'm taking on my Christian radio program is respect for everybody, respect for diversity, mm -hmm. um, inclusion, listening to the viewpoints of all people and trying to analyse those to help the Christian community understand and the issues. what are your thoughts on the fact that the, one of those viewpoints wasn't actually even factual? Because Miss Wyatt, I believe, says that the principal said that her son couldn't wear dresses, which actually the principal has come out and said he didn't actually say. Well, as I say, I don't know about Miss Wyatt. I've never met her. I don't know what that argument is. Mm. But if you think that there's not a big concern amongst parents about this issue... I'm sorry, there is. Mm. You can't just dismiss just, it and tell them they're stupid. Right. I just want to bring in Ali at this point. Yep. Now, Stephen's been talking to you about concerns in the Christian community. Um, we know there are strong concerns in the, in the yes. Muslim community. We know there's strong opposition, but we're not hearing those voices. Why is that? I think the uh, main reason you're not hearing these voices uh, in support of no vote is because Muslims are afraid that they'll be just straight away being uh, called an extremist as soon as they come out with an opinion. So Muslims are afraid to express their opinion either way. Is that true? Wouldn't they be seen as a moderate if they uh, came out with the, that opinion? No, I think uh, uh, a lot of Muslim community people are concerned and have same concerns which Stephen raised, that they are afraid that their religious rights will be trampled. I mean, the Islamic schools, or they would have to follow a national curriculum which will teach things which goes against the fundamentals of their religion. So they're concerned about it. As far as the ad is concerned, uh, look, my major concern about the ad was whether it was factual or not. If it was unfactual, then we will have a problem which, which happened in, in England with Brexit, where a lot of information or fake ads created this environment yeah. which pushed people towards the no vote, which they regretted later on. So I agree, we should have a debate. We should have a respectful debate, but uh, we should have debates with the facts. Now, as uh, somebody who is not well versed with safe school program, I haven't read it, I don't know what it includes, but if I, as a Muslim, was to sit down and see and, and, uh, and think that this curriculum is going to be forced in Islamic college or Islamic school, I would have some concerns about it. Right, as in, and, and a lot of religious people would have those concerns, and that would push a lot of religious people toward towards no. Mm -hmm. So we need to make sure if we are going to talk about ad or any argument made by either side, we need to ensure the facts are accurate, and we need to talk about those facts instead of just shutting down an ad. And I think, in response to this, the Yes campaign should come up with a factual ad about Safe School Program and the impact it's going to have, or, or the or the plebiscite will have on the Safe School Program and any other legislation to counter this. And that's what we should be talking about. We should be talking about both sides, factual arguments from both sides. Mm. And what percentage of the Muslim community do you think would be would be opposing this? It, I'm not asking for a percentage, I'm asking for a word, a significant proportion, a strong majority. Like, we're not hearing those voices and it's difficult to assess 
if there's any dissension within the Muslim community, if there's any debate or disagreement or dispute? Th there, are dis there are disagreements. Muslim community is no different than any other community. Yeah, we have yeah. those kind of discussions yeah. internally. Unfortunately, in the current climate, the problem is that the right and the conservative side has always attacked Muslims of being terrorists and extremists. And naturally, the left side has been allies in, in defending us for a long period of time. So we are afraid, you know, that if we come out with our opinion, then left may abandon us for going against their view. And we can't really be very friendly with the conservative on the right side because they've been bashing us for 15, 20 years, every chance they get. And that includes, unfortunately, some religious conservative Christian sects as well. They've been attacking us and calling us terrorists. So we are afraid to come out and express our opinion. But we are no different to any other community. We are having this concern. So we share concerns which Stephen raised. And there is concern. There are some people in the Muslim community who believe that we want to know the facts. Uh, are, are, is, will, that have, will this have an impact on a safe school program or will it not have an impact? Will it uh, trample up upon our religious freedom because we are already afraid to build mosques because you get the right wing groups propping up and complaining about mosques. So would, would this have impact, further impact on our religious rights and freedoms? Mm -hmm. So the Muslim community is not speaking is simply because the climate which is created in this country where we are not allowed to speak, we speak up and we're call, either called a terrorist, unpatriotic and all those slurs and all those words. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're missing out in having our say in this debate and I think that's the wrong thing. Okay. All right, let's move to another matter now, which affects every household in the nation, which is electricity. Now, as significantly higher power bills are delivered to people across the country, Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull has again met with the heads of energy companies to push them to tell customers there are better deals out there. As many as two million Australian families are paying more for their electricity than they ought to be paying. We received the agreement of the companies to move to a system whereby people can better access their consumption data and their payment data on a barcode on their bill. And by using a smartphone or a similar device, they can click on that barcode and then automatically get access to better deals that are available in the market. But meanwhile, as the government struggles to find solutions to high power prices, the energy sector is changing fast and the traditional utilities are up against dynamic consumer behaviours and technologies. Now, we've seen this before. It's disruption. And the question is, could this help bring down costs? Increasingly around Australia, those who can afford it are, are installing solar panels on their roofs, about 1.7 million households so far. The panels reduce electricity costs and as small scale battery storage improves, households will become increasingly energy self-sufficient. But there are limitations to this. A recent study in Western Australia found that renters and poorer people, such as single parents and the elderly, will be less able to take advantage of this solar revolution. So, is this where disruptors could come in, allowing the direct trading of excess energy between customers, including those who don't have panels of their own? And where does that leave the utilities? Well, David Martin has worked in the electricity industry for over 17 years, including as an executive in two state-owned utilities. He's left the sector to co-found a company that allows homeowners and businesses to sell excess solar energy to neighbours without a middleman taking a cut. David, welcome to The Drum. Thanks for having me. Now, many say when prices rise, fertile ground is laid for disruptive technologies. What do you think disruption will or could look like in the energy sector and will it benefit consumers? Absolutely. I think disruption is probably an extension to what we're already seeing. And as you described earlier, 1.7 million households with rooftop solar panels. And that's forecast to, by some forecast, to treble over the next 15 or so years. So the, the energy system of the future is very much one that's going to be co-created with consumers. And, you know, network businesses and, and energy utilities used to think that they sat in the middle of a giant web and controlled the way that the system would develop. Uh, and that was, the, that was the case 10 years ago. But now as consumers are really taking, um, taking the, the lead in how the energy system is being uh, developed and how, um, how, how new capacity is being installed, consumers really are at the heart of how the system is going to look in the future. Is decentralisation inevitable? 
I think we're already a long way there. So over the last six or seven years, there's been more new generation installed on Australian roofs than has been installed on Australian transmission systems. So you can see the shape of the industry really has changed. It used to be uh, a linear system with big power stations pushing energy through poles and wire networks out to consumers. But now consumers themselves have become power stations. And you know, I live next door to a, a power station. There's no reason in the world why I shouldn't be able to access the energy directly off my next door neighbour's roof and pay him directly for it. The technology's there, the energy flows that way, we're not trying to change the laws of physics, but we are trying to change the laws of the market to allow consumers to benefit and from their investments in rooftop solar capacity. But how does that guarantee base load and make sure that when push comes to shove, the hot day in summer, the cold day in winter, uh, we haven't un undermined enough of our traditional energy producers that we don't have enough to cope for those days? I don't think anybody's suggesting that we should flip from one system to another. Um, I think there will be a case for at least the next 20 years or so for large scale um, generation to provide that, that inertia in the system to ride through faults to provide peaking capacity. But what we're doing at the moment is, is forcing residential consumers by and large, small use consumers, to play by the rules of the big boys mm. and we're not valuing their contribution to the system. And uh, there are, you know, there are there are reasons for that. We've always had a system that, you know, for the last 15 or 20 years, has had a, a regulatory framework that's operated the same way with the same sort of topology in the network. But now we're forcing customers to play by that space as well. And the end result of that, especially as as the the cost of storage falls, is we're giving consumers an option to get off and getting off the network um, f in in large volumes, um, whether it's in, in total or just the significant pro proportion of their energy consumption, is no good for any of us. Stephen, isn't this something, somewhere, something that the government should be involved in in terms of consumer protection and providing those guarantees that you've just addressed? Well, I think the government has a couple of roles here. The first is to provide protections for consumers and provide for the baseload power so that our hospitals, well, you know, even you know, just people in the community don't suddenly lose power as ABC, they've done in South ABC, Australia and, and the ABC, for yes. instance. Yes. <laughs> well done. But also the government has a responsibility, if the market has changed, to get in and before it becomes uberized mm. and the market basically collapses under the weight of disruption, it needs to create opportunities for consumers within reasonable regulation to now take part in the new system. And I'm, in, I'm a classic case. We would love to have solar power, but every time we look at it, it changes. Batteries either can or can't be installed. Mm. Local councils have rules about where you put stuff. You know, so we just say, too hard. Right can't do it. Right, and there's got to be a lot of people in that position, but someone who does have a strong strong view on power is Ali. Yes, and I think disruption is necessary, especially with the blockchain technology. Yes. Uh, what we will be able to do now is effectively allow uh, the producer, individual producer at a house or a colony to sell that electricity or sell that energy to people who are willing to buy in their neighbourhood. Mm -hmm. So we're not talking about getting off completely from the grid. We're not talking about uh, shutting down the coal power, uh, power station in the next 20 years. But what we're talking about is that sun is free. The sun is producing a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. Let's use it. All right, let's produce it at our homes and let's sell it to our neighbours. And I think, uh, and this is a question for Dave, I guess, uh, I do read, uh, read about, I did read about a, a company which is actually talking about producing the energy at homes and then effectively donating it to the people who can't afford to pay for the electric Oh, wait, and I just should add, before, before we go to you on this question, Dave, um, we should point out that you have invested in blockchain technologies. Yes, I technologies. do, yes. Yes, I have investment in cryptocurrencies. Right, yeah. so, yes. so you are a fan of this. Yeah, yes. but what, what, what do you make of that model, more of an altruistic, potentially philanthropic model. Dave. I think it's a great model and, and using a technology like the blockchain that disintermediates that whole trading process means we can pull price out of uh, out of the energy sector. If you're if you're selling energy to your next door neighbour or you're even gifting your energy to your next door neighbour, you're not using the entire network. You, in fact, you may only be using you know, a couple of millimetres of a connection of, at, at the network point where both you and your neighbour are connected to the grid. So making you pay for the entire network uh, doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. Forcing you to pay a retailer for that electricity, uh, adding on market costs, retail margins, all those other costs doesn't make sense. And, and that's, the, that's the risk I think the system faces, that if we keep presenting the customer with these, these scenarios that just don't make sense, the price of energy storage is falling, uh, the, the capacity and, the, and the, uh, the efficiency of PV panels are increasing, and network businesses particularly are being faced with competition that they've never faced before. Uh, uh, Yet we still treat them as they, though they are monopoly businesses. And, and Dave, with smart contracts, uh, can they, can they uh, control the supply and demand of the electricity as well uh, through blockchain? Would that yeah. be possible? 
they, they can control the, the, the supply and demand, they can control the price. I think we've had technology that's allowed smart networks to develop over the last 15 or 20 years, but we haven't seen them develop in big numbers because utilities have always had to own all of the assets and they're expensive to build. Mm. But consumers now are installing those assets themselves. Mm. You've only got to look down any suburban street and you will see you know, 20 percent of the houses there will have solar panels. Give it 15 years and 40 percent will have solar panels and 25 percent will have batteries as well. And that's a really different scenario for, for network businesses to manage and for systems to, to maintain power quality and reliability. If you don't enrol the customer in providing those services and create the sort of incentive framework that encourages them to, 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 to operate within the system in ways that protects the system and the, and the, and the needs of other consumers, then you know, we really are pushing the network to the brink of where consumers do have the option just to disappear. Right, and will utilities be able to keep up with this? disruption. What are their challenges, Dave? I think the challenge really is a mindset one. It, mm. Somebody mentioned Uber before and I think the, the beauty of the Uber model is it's demonstrated you don't have to own um, the entire taxi fleet. You, you can be one consumer with excess capacity that's monetising that capacity using a really good framework. But David, and if your entire public transport system depends on the taxi industry still being able to provide a level of service, you've got to get in early before that happens in the electricity industry. So this is why I think, can you think of a way that government could open up new markets in a way that also protected the traditional generators to, you know, to some degree, but also bring about competition. Absolutely. I think that the, the distributed market and the wholesale market can operate in parallel. Mm. They have, you know, they have some similarities and they do have some complementary points. I think that the key will be recognising that we do have a distributed market now uh, and we, we do have consumers that are much, uh, much more active participants in the whole energy, um, energy market. So we need to disaggregate or, or bifurcate that market, split mm. it, look at it as under its wholesale, its typical wholesale model, but understand that there's this distributed market that's operating there as well and can be a solid contributor to the wholesale space if we allow it, if we get the rules set but, right and we provide incentives for customers. But then look with yeah. Stephen, um, Britannica Encyclopedia, you know, it, oh, yes. it became redundant with, yes. uh, with Wikipedia yes. and, and I think eventually any technology as this develops as well uh, will eventually make uh, generation of coal fired power stations redundant. It will well, do that. It may marvelous. take a long, long, yeah. long time, yeah. but yeah. it will eventually but do that. But imagine if Britannica had got online straight away. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that that, that's Wikipedia. what we're talking about. We're talking moment. about the exactly. traditional power stations to adapt and adapt to the new technology and the changes. Well, because we see, you know, in the banking sector them being disrupted, you know, with fintech. But mm -hmm. the thing is, CBA or NABs and things like that, they are proactively investing in these startups and doing accelerator programs and things like that. And I'm interested to know, I mean, do you see these utilities perhaps, you know, starting accelerators or investing in some of these more innovative disruptive technologies. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Some of the, the Australian uh, utility businesses are, are leading the world in the way that they've embraced uh, new technologies. Uh, and now they are moving to a space too that they understand that their market's changing and they need to find uh, a model that's it's, it's a halfway house between the traditional mm -hmm. wholesale market supply and something that encourages consumers to stay connected, that maintains the network as a low cost path to market for a retailer and, and pro provides those protections as you described earlier for consumers that can't afford to play in this space. Mm. So Australian utility businesses are actually doing a pretty good job and I think I've spoken to most of them in the last 18 months and there are some that are doing an outstanding mm. job. All right Dave Martin thank you so much for joining us this evening Pleasure. on The Drum. Thank you. Now to matters religious. In a first for the church in Australia the Anglicans have elected a female archbishop for the Diocese of Perth. Right Reverend Kay Goldsworthy will start in the role next year and says she hopes her election to the top job will inspire other women in the church to seek out leadership roles. In all sorts of ways, I think what it says is that for most and many people and places in the church in Australia, the issue of women's leadership is really no longer an issue. What does something like this mean to women outside the church? Gemma? Um, so I think this is amazing. Um, please do not get me wrong. I think this is something to be celebrated. I do have to somewhat object to the statement that women's leadership is no longer an issue. Um, you know, we saw famously, obviously, with Julia Gillard. I think she was saying women's leadership in the church. Oh, oh in, in the people and places in the people church. People and in places in yeah. the church. 
whether it's the church or it's the wider community or politics or business, it's it's exactly the same issue that uh, that we have everywhere. Um, so what we really need to see now is Kay, you know, being that role model and the church, I guess, elevating other women um, up into those positions as well. Because otherwise, you know, Julia Gillard was prime minister, and have we seen much of a change in politics around the balance between men and women? No, we haven't. Um, but the private sector, you know, they're taking very, you know, huge efforts to make sure that they're really elevating women up because because you need that. You can't just have one token, essentially. Not like Kay's a token. And like I said, this is something to be celebrated. I think it's bringing the church, you know, forward um, and it's very modern and, and that's a brilliant thing. And I think it will probably, you'll see more followers essentially potentially out of this as well. Mm. Stephen, how do, how do you see it? And is she right to say there's no more problems with female leadership in the church? Uh, she hasn't lived in Sydney. Um, so. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> There's a few, yes. And I think that's the pockets. problem. I think around Australia this will be celebrated and I think it's a good thing, but I acknowledge that there are a number of people, especially in the Sydney Diocese of the Anglican Church, for whom this will be a massive issue. And the question next is, do they stay in communion with the church mm -hmm. in Perth as a result of what's happened there? Um, and I actually think that well, I mean, my own view, Julia, as you would probably know, is that uh, headship has been too much focused on, particularly in the time of the last Archbishop in Sydney. It became an issue that was, that was um, uh, out of proportion biblically uh, for what it was about, and it's actually prevented the church from having, um, in some people's minds, a credible voice on issues like domestic violence. Mm. So Sydney needs to solve that problem and it needs to do it well. Mm. And if it's going to disagree with Perth, it needs to model good disagreement. But let's f please not have the church fighting with itself again mm. on this one. Yeah, to, and to, to explain to people who don't, that's, there are pockets, mm. one or two dioceses that remain that still do not ordain women yeah. to the priesthood while others have gone on to archbishop. And it does create consequences in communion, partly because bishops um, consecrate other priests or lay their hands on it go, kind of goes down the yeah. chain. Now to Islam. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Why are there no female imams in this country? We, we don't, first of all look, uh, we're not like um, a Christian church, we don't have a hierarchy. So there is no uh, structure, we don't have archbishops, we don't have bishops, we don't have popes. Uh, we have a very flat structure. Now Islamically speaking the word for a scholar is alim and there is a word for a female scholar which is alima and Islam says both males and females it incumbent, it's incumbent on them to get religious education and become scholars so we have female scholars mm. we have females who, are, who do lectures to men and women from around the world from internet sometimes using technology so they talk about religion they talk about religious issues now it comes to a role of an imam imam is somebody who leads a prayer I can lead a prayer I don't need a, a, a professional title to lead a prayer anybody can be an imam now, when we pray in the mosque in a congregation, we generally appoint one person who is more educated than anybody else in Islam, and that person leads the prayer. And it's compulsory for men or more advisable for men to go and pray in the mosque than it is to women. Women can pray at home and they get the same reward. So women don't have to travel to the mosque to pray. Women can pray from home. Men, it's more advisable to pray from the mosque. So we can't put the same model of the Christian church to Islam mm. and ask why don't we have an imam or female imam. And now females go, sometimes go to the mosque, sometimes don't go to the mosque. But when we appoint somebody an imam in a mosque, that person's job is to lead prayers five times. That becomes a job role. But there are still some women from mm. um, Muslims for pro MPB, Muslims yes. for Progressive, progressive Voice, values, yeah. um, who are saying we've, they, we really need more imams in, uh, you know, we need a lot more female leaders in the Muslim faith in I, Australia. I, I think, look, again, we have to differentiate what it means to be a female leader mm. and what it means to be an imam. A female can be a scholar, she can go and study Islam, she can study Islamic jurisprudence and lead and educate people about mm -hmm. Islam. That's an Islamic scholar, that's a scholar who is, uh, who is teaching Islam. Now, an imam is somebody who leads a prayer in a mosque. Mm -hmm. Now, since it's incumbent, incumbent and compulsory for men to pray in the mosque and not compulsory for females to pray in the mosque, generally there are males who are who are the imams in the mosque. But uh, we can't confuse the role of an imam mm. to be the role of an of a archbishop or, or, or a pope. But it's is this the way thing. it should stay? You think the women should be praying at home and the men should be playing in the mosque and they should have a male 
leader there? You know, to be honest, I, I, I would rather, uh, there are a lot of other issues Muslim females are facing. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of other issues they're facing. And I think we need to address those issues right now. What, and would, be, what would be your top priority? If, if I want to do anything uh, for, for Muslim females here, I want to give them the confidence that they can go out religiously and from uh, uh, without the fear from the right-wing extremists. They can go out and take ownership of this country, take ownership of their religion, and come out and express themselves as anybody else does. Which is every, what everyone on our, on our panel always does. Thanks so much. We're going to have to end it there. Gemma Lloyd, Stephen O'Doherty, Ali Kadri. We'll see you again tomorrow night.